It's the knockouts on MasterChef The Professionals. Last time, two more chefs were sent home, leaving the strongest 10. Now, they're being split into two groups to face a brand new MasterChef challenge. It's a big push. I'm starting to feel the stress a little bit. Before returning to fight for a place in the semi-finals. The competition is incredibly tough. The other chefs, they're blowing my mind. I think this competition is starting to really, really stick in all of us, actually. Maybe I'm getting a little bit addicted to the buzz. Place in the semi-final would mean everything. You can't really rest on your laurels. You just got to keep pushing and pushing. Today is a massive day for our chefs. They get into the nitty gritty end of this competition. The bar has been lifted and there's some great talent emerging in this kitchen. In recent years, the pop-up restaurant and street food scene has exploded up and down the country. Everything from car parks to shipping containers are being transformed by inventive young chefs and food entrepreneurs into some of the country's most cutting edge dining destinations. Tonight, Jan, Exose, Andrew, Abinda, and Tom will be opening the very first MasterChef Professionals pop-up, a pergola, a botanical rooftop in London's Kensington Olympia. Never done anything like this before. It's completely new to me. Yeah, really out of my comfort zone, to be honest. It's new, it's different, and I've always wanted to do a pop-up, so it's a great opportunity for me to finally fulfill that. This is a big challenge, but yeah, I'm up for this, I'm ready. Bring, bring it on. <laughs> Great food isn't always just about fine dining. It can be something very, very different. It's going to be scary. They've not faced anything like this before. Actually, no, have we? <laughs> Chefs, welcome to our MasterChef pop-up restaurant. Pop-up venues like this have sprung up all over the country and they have really helped some key chefs forge fantastic reputations. This is your opportunity to do just that. You'll each be cooking one dish which you will be serving to 25 specially invited guests here today. These guests are leaders in the pop-up food industry. You want to impress them. Now here's the twist. We are asking our guests to vote for their best dish. That chef will go straight through to our semi-final. A little bit of added pressure there for you today, chefs. Three hours to lunch. Off you go. During the two and a half hours prep time, the contestants will have to share kitchen space and equipment to create their dish. Our chefs are cooking in a more casual setup than what they're used to, but their food has still got to deliver. We want refinement, we want elegance, we want great presentation, we want creative thinking, we want something maybe a little bit different that we've not seen before. Event chef Jan is creating the South American inspired dish of barbecued lamb neck with a Peruvian chili sauce. When I found out that we were doing a pop-up, I got very excited. Recently, just got back from a trip in Peru uh, where I've learned a lot. I visited a lot of markets and learned a lot about uh, specialties over there. I love lamb neck. It's a great piece of meat for barbecuing. It lends itself perfectly for this dish. He has to prepare the two and a half kilos of lamb quickly. As before it can be barbecued, it needs to be cooked sous vide for two hours in a ricotto chili marinade. So ricotto is a chili from South America, and I brought that paste back from Peru, so I'm incorporating to the marinade. It's gonna taste great. Try to um, 
get done as soon as possible so I can start cooking the lamb. And it's gonna take a while to cook in the water bath, so I'm just going as fast as I can. Executive chef Arbinda is getting to work on his version of a sweet and savory Indian street food dish called chaat. You will find it in each and every corner in India. Every region has got a different version of it. I'm just, you know, bringing this dish to another level. For those of us who haven't tried the traditional chaat, what would that be? It will be like you've got a sweet element in it, which is going to come from the little bit of yogurt. There will be different kind of chutneys. It has a, a papri, which is a crisp, and it's going to have a spicy element in it. So it's all about sweet, savory, salty, spicy, and lots of different textures and tastes. Is this you know, inspired by childhood memories from, from back home? Yeah, it's very much uh, childhood memories. In the evening, we used to get a guy coming on the road every time, 4 o'clock, 5 o'clock, we knew he's going to come take the money from mum and you know, just stand and wait for him to come. Well, here we only get the ice cream van coming around, but that sounds wonderful. I can't wait to try it. Thank you. Abinda's doing a vegetarian dish today, and it sounds really interesting. I think this could be a winner. We've got a few little twists as well. He's using quinoa, avocado. We've also got a pomegranate sorbet. Now, that intrigues me. So I'm just making a sorbet mix. I'm just bringing it to boil, and then I'm going to start turning up in the ice cream machine. Let it set nicely, and then I can crack on all the rest of the ingredients. Andrew is cooking a dish inspired by his travels in the Navy. I've gone for place, and I've got four really big place to fill it. Place is a very delicate fish. You've got to treat it with care. So I'm taking my time with it because it is the main element of the dish. It's got to be, it's got to be really neat and tidy. Andrew, it's a little bit different, isn't it? It is a bit different, yeah. Yeah, I like it. This dish is actually kind of based on everywhere that I've been around the world. It's a bit of a fusion of different flavors from different countries. Yeah. I remember when I was in France, I had the most amazing moules marinere that I was flavored with loads of tarragon. So I've brought that into my sauce, as well as saffron potatoes. In India, it was the most incredible saffron. Amazing flavor. We bought loads of it because it's so much cheaper there as well. So it's a nice memory from India. I've also got lavash bread, which is from my travels of Turkey. Good. Well, I love the look of that fish and I love the look of those mussels. So I'm really, really looking forward to trying your dish. Thank you, chef. Senior sous chef Tom is busy preparing a beer and onion sauce for a dish based on the flavors of a classic American hot dog. I think it reminds me of being at a festival and you smell the roasted onion on the barbecue and you're just queuing up. The beer sauce, obviously, when you go to a festival, you have a couple beers. So hopefully, tasting the dish, all together, it tastes like you're eating a hot dog. Uh, that really does smell like a festival to me, that smell. Instead of a frankfurter, Tom will be using pork loin, which will be cooked sous vide and then finished on the barbecue. Probably one of my favorite cuts of pork, really. Obviously, it needs to be so pink. If, if I ever cook it, it will be quite horrible to eat. Tom's dish sounds very simple, but in saying that, I like the sound of it. Barbecue tenderloin, American mustard mayonnaise with pickled cabbage and a beer sauce sounds fantastic. Don't want any of the flavors in there. I just want the taste of pork. I just want it to sing hot dog. 22-year-old chef de partie Exosé is the only one attempting a dessert. I've got a lot to do today, a lot of big jobs that uh, need a lot of time to set as well. Based on flavors of banoffee, his complex dish has nine separate elements. Exosé, I have to say, what you're doing with those bananas, they are one of the first things I remember as a child uh, back in the islands, roasting these bananas on an on a open fire pit. It smells amazing. Thank you. They're doing a good banana ice cream, so I'm going to use some of the skin in there as well. You get that barbecue flavor in there. You're putting the banana skin into the, the ice cream? Yes. Not too much, otherwise it'll be too bitter and uh, claggy. Wow, I've never had banana skin in an ice cream. Not intentionally, <laughs> I don't think. So I'm looking at your bench here, Exosé. I'm noticing there's a lot of ingredients. 
not much equipment, and you're, doing, <laughs> and you're doing pastry. I think you've got to take risk in this competition. Uh, you won't get uh, far if you're just too safe. Exorze is making a roasted caramelized bananas, crispy bananas, caramel. Is also making a caramel beignet. This dessert has already won me. I want to try it. I'm making my own fudge today. It's a bit risky because fudge normally take a long time to set. Happy with that? Sexy. <laughs> there is no oven in this kitchen, so like Thursday is going to have to be on his toes today. It's hot and he doesn't have all the usual gadgets a pastry chef loves. Doing pastry with one hob is more or less impossible. You need more, loads of stuff on at the same time, but um, I'll work with it. I've got enough time, hopefully. Chefs, you are halfway through prep time. I'm just finishing up on the fish prep, so I've still got a lot to do. I wanted to take my time on this fish, because it's the main element. I want it to be the star of the show. I really like the energy that's coming off our chefs with this challenge. They've really grabbed it with both hands. Not one of them wants to miss out on their opportunity of sailing straight through to our semi-finals. And I think it's giving them the extra oomph to really push hard today. Ice cream, ice cream, ice cream, ice cream, ice cream. Should have been in about 30 minutes ago, but hopefully it'll still set in time. To go with his barbecue lamb neck, Jan is serving crispy saffron potatoes. Very small potatoes. Take it a little bit more time. <laughs> the fact that I cut them in cube like this, that's something that my grandmother used to do. Before he fries them, they're blanched in a pot of chicken stock, garlic, rosemary and saffron. How are you finding our challenge? Half of my business is based on pop-up and street food, so uh, I'm very much um, into that scene. You're quite comfortable with the setup that we have. It's very limited. You don't have an oven. You know, your workspace is, is very small. This doesn't stress you at all? Uh, not at all. I've got a very similar setup. We've got a pop-up on the rooftop in Dalston, so it's a very similar setup. So you're doing a pop-up right now? Yes, yes, we are. Jan, my expectations are now up here with your pop-up dish. I mean, this is playing into your strengths. It can't go wrong. I mean, there's still plenty of uh, things that can go wrong, obviously, but uh, I don't want to jump the guns. But yeah, I feel, I feel very excited about it, for sure. Our binder has moved on to one of the key elements of his vegetarian street food chart dish, a complex spice pomegranate dressing. This particular dressing which I'm making is basically from uh, Punjab region in Amritsar, around about 10 to 12 spices. So it's all about balancing the flavors. He's also making a mixture of five different seeds with honey and mustard, which needs to be toasted to give it texture. And where does this sit in the, in the dish? Is it the base? This will be on top of the quinoa, and uh, the sorbet will be sitting on top of the avocado. So you're just cooking in the pan just to caramelize it slowly? Yeah, because you don't have an oven and uh, using the plancher. <laughs> so normally you toast this in the oven? In the oven, yeah. slow oven. Yeah. OK, yeah. but you don't have an oven here today, yeah. so yeah. this is so, how we do it. Yeah. <laughs> it's all about adapting, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Andrew's place dish is accompanied by mussels, which will be pickled in a cider vinegar and fennel seed liquor. Mussels look perfect, nice and plump. Now just going into a pickling liquor, just to really enhance the flavor of the seaside and the mussels. So now my biggest concern is still the lavash bread. Still haven't started that yet, and that is, that is a big job, just making bread from scratch. His Turkish-inspired lavash bread is flavored with mussel powder and squid ink. What is it exactly? So lavash bread is like a paper-thin, crispy, unleavened bread. It's going to be kind of like reminiscent of if you could eat a mussel shell, that's what it should taste and feel right. like. It should be crunchy, it should taste like the sea, it should be salty. So I'm going to try and bring that into it. While Andrew rolls out his lavash bread, Tom is roasting his onions for his hot dog dish. I want them quite dark in colour, so you get that really roasted smell, like, off the grill when you're standing waiting for your hot dog. Good to be a little bit different. Yeah, it should be quite a cool dish, really. It smells good. 
Thanks, Jeff. He's also preparing hispy cabbage two ways. One in a hot pickle, and the other will be finished on the barbecue after being brined in salt water. I'm going to brine it for an hour. It makes it a bit more juicy, so it don't dry out when you roast it. And obviously, an American hot dog, you have cabbage in it. Exose has his roasted banana ice cream and his caramel fudge setting. But he still needs to make his banoffee beignet, banana fritters, and his caramelized banana garnish. I've given myself a lot to do. It's a big push. If I do get it out in time, it will work out, hopefully. Ooh, what's the syrup? Spice rum and lime syrup. Can I try one? Yes, chef. I think you're missing the rum. Well, rum. There we go. And when it says rum, you want to taste the rum. The plan is to get him drunk so they can't taste it all. <laughs> OK, so that's a lot now. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. Chefs, you've got 30 minutes of prep time left. And also, the guests have started to arrive. The 25 guests for today's event are some of the UK's most successful pop-up entrepreneurs. We started Smoking Soul in 2014 as a series of supper clubs until we really settled on a home in Pop Brixton in 2017 and essentially running our own real restaurant out of a shipping container. Pretty much put anything on the menu that we want to put on and no one's stopping us from doing that. It's got to be as good as restaurant quality, but not in a restaurant setting. Me and Mike have been friends since we were kids. We bought this old trailer uh, off eBay and pimped it up. From day one, it was hard, graft. But we had great fun and very quickly had regulars. Uh, and we knew we'd hit something. I think we started the business for £6,000. That was with stock and a week's rent and nothing else. We believe that if you keep true to what you do and people respect and identify with that and they'll keep coming back and back. The food we serve is home-cooked style Vietnamese foods. All the recipes come from our grandma. She left us a cookbook. We were a pop-up for about two years and we all had our day jobs. We had such a huge following that we thought, why not look for a restaurant? You feel quite spoiled once you get a restaurant because there's so much more space. I've seen the guest. It's getting real now. Final 30 minutes to just get everything set. No pressure, I say. <laughs> I'm not stressed at all. Yeah, it looks like a really trendy bunch. I hope they're going to like what I've done for them. There has to be some flair, some originality. So you do have to bring something to it that's telling a story, I think, something that reflects your history, your background, and that really needs to come across on each plate. It's not a commercial restaurant space, so you haven't got big fridges and big grills and big ovens, and you need to figure out how you can deliver the best dish you can using a very, very small amount of equipment. With service fast approaching, all five chefs still have work to do. Jan has made his chimichurri sauce, and it's finally time to see if his lamb neck is tender. Yeah, so they softened up. Yeah, pretty good. While Tom is finishing off his American mustard mayonnaise. Very nice. Just how I wanted it. I think it worked really well with the dish. I'm happy with that. Arbinda and Andrew still have to finish off their crispy breads. Lavash bread, it's not a very common thing in this country, but I suppose that's the whole point in pop-ups, isn't it, is to show people things they've never had before. It's called papri. This needs to be crispy, so, which is the main crispy element uh, in the dish. I'm going to make 30 35 discs, so I think it'll be OK. Meanwhile, Exose has only just started his banoffee beignet. Yeah, I've been working hard, I've been pushing it. Once I've cooked the beignets, I'm going to fill them with the banoffee puree. You have 15 minutes prep time left. A couple of these chefs got a huge amount of work that they've got to get through. 
there is no turning back now. There is no room for error. It's all about the last minute cookery, getting those final touches coming together, everything tasting right, looking good. It's uh, too soft. I'm just concerned about my sorbet. Still not yet set. Now you're going to see some pressure in this kitchen. I'm starting to feel the stress a little bit. I'm the first chef to go as well, so it's a little bit extra pressure to open the, the show. Chefs, prep time is over. You need to clean down and set up for service. Jan, you're first up. Are we all ready? Yes, I'm ready, chef. Perfect. Let's do it. Jan will now have 30 minutes to cook and serve his lamb dish. Barbecue lamb neck with saffron potatoes. Chimichurri, Peruvian chili sauce. Before plating, he has to deep fry his saffron potatoes and perfectly sear the lamb neck without overcooking it. You want that nice caramelization on the outside, but you don't want it to cook all the way through, otherwise it's going to be super chewy. How long we got? I'm finishing to cut the lamb, and then I can build the plates. I was very worried from the beginning that it might be a little bit chewy. It's pretty much a hit and miss with lamb. All good? It's very soft, just like I wanted it to be. Soft and potatoes sound great. Peruvian chili sauce, you want some heat. Really good combination of flavors there. You've got the punchy chili sauce with the sort of herby chimichurri. This is your chimichurri? Yes, give a little bit of herb and punch to the meat. You happy? I hope I capture the essence of the challenge, really. But I think everything tastes pretty good, in my opinion. Service, please. It makes me want to dive right in. I can't wait. I'm so excited. That's delicious. Smells great as well. So can't wait to get tucked in. It's a lovely presentation. It's nice to see so much color. Hopefully, it tastes as good as it looks. I'll eat that any day. I mean, I'm, I'm happy with this. This is totally the kind of thing I would do for a pop-up. Hopefully, that reaches the judge's expectation. But pretty happy nonetheless. So we'll see. I can eat that all day. Delicious lamb, really moist. The saffron comes through really nicely. I was expecting more of a chilli kick on it, but overall, very good. The lamb just melts in your mouth, and the potatoes didn't have too much saffron, which I really liked. Lovely fresh taste for the chimichurri and the greenery. The lamb rested really nicely, so the meat was really lovely and tender. It was a nice balance of flavours. The only thing I would say is I thought it would be a bit more spicy and it had a bit more of a punchy kick to it. I think the tenderness of the lamb is fantastic. The marinade has worked a treat with it, and I love the way he's cooked it. I love the saffron potatoes as well. I think Jan has done a great job here. He really has brought the flavors of South America to this plate of food. Abinda, they're ready for your course. Yep, yes, sir. Abinda's vegetarian chart is up next. He still needs to fry his papri crisps, as well as plate the seven different elements of his dish. We've got our Binder's Indian street food chart with quinoa avocado mixed seed chart, pomegranate sorbet, and a caraway crisp. Would you normally find quinoa in northern Indian food? Not really. So this is your take? Yeah. Avocado is not typical Indian thing that's going on in there. Um, but, you know, why, why not? Abinda, you've got about five minutes left. What's left to go on the plate? Seeds, yogurt gel. What's that one? It's uh, mango and chili chill. How's the sorbet? Sorbet's looking OK now. It's set now. I'm happy with the sorbet. Because that's something you wouldn't expect to see with chat, so I wonder how that's going to work. Very warm in there. Yeah, it's really warm. Yeah. You're going to have to be quick. This is street food with speed. This one's got hot, cold, crunchy. It's got loads of different things going on, so quite a lot that could go wrong. Service, please. Super interesting. <laughs> yeah, it looks really pretty. You really need to pick up the pace a little bit now. 
Yes, Chef. I would be worried about doing that for hundreds. But I mean, it looks great. You seem very calm and relaxed there, Abinda. It was very good. Very happy with myself. Does anything phase you? <laughs> the quinoa is cooked perfectly. I think the coolness of the sorbet and the spices sort of marry up really well. Taste buds are having a party. I just love everything in there. Someone who cooked this is just genius. Well, this one is flavor, and it's crunchy. It is nice, and it's fresh. I feel slightly confused by the dish as to whether it's a dessert or a savory dish. I think the sorbet throws you off in that sense. The avocado may be a little bit out of place on an Asian dish, but yeah, very very nice. It felt like a lot of quinoa with a few other components added onto it. I mean, I wasn't a massive fan of it. It's actually a very sweet dish, and then slowly you get a bit of warmth with the, the heat coming through it. For me, the sorbet is, 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 is just bringing too much sweetness. The yogurt's nice, the puree is nice, and the avocado brings a sort of neutral freshness to the dish. Where I'm struggling is the sweetness that cuts across the whole thing, especially with the sorbet. Andrew's place and muscle dish is next in the spotlight. He's just finishing frying off the lavash bread. That's delicious. But the place has to be cooked right at the last minute. Fish is a really tricky thing to cook en masse. Perfect temperature, perfect texture is a really, really big ask. Cooking something like place in a street food environment could be the most unforgiving dish. So I'll be interested to see how it comes out. Do you not think of doing it something like a fish soup would have been easier? Definitely would have been easier, but <laughs> I'm trying to impress you. <laughs> All right, good on you. Muscles. I will be really interesting that pickle because myself also use a pickle muscle before. So interesting. How are we looking? Yeah, on track, chef. This is your lavash bread? Yep, that's the lavash bread. It smells good. Mm. Lovely. Nice colours. I'm happy, yeah. It looks nice and vibrant. That's the way I wanted it to come out. Service. The colour's amazing. I didn't expect the flatbed to look like that. That look really inviting. So this. I really love my dish. It's all about flavour. That's the most important thing at the end of the day. Might have been a little bit rustic looking on the plate, but I think that's kind of the point in pop-up. The flavor's really good, so hopefully that is enough to get me that, that top spot. The fish is just so silky. It just melts in the mouth. It's cooked to perfection. The samphire adds a real nice saltiness to it. Beautiful, really nice. Tastes like the sea. The tarragon and the sauce was really nice, and I thought the pickled mussel really kind of cut through. You wouldn't be disappointed with that if you got served it in a Michelin star restaurant. So, yeah. Mussel is sour and salty. That is perfect dish for me. It's not very street foody, but it's a blinding dish, I think. I'm really surprised that he's managed to pull it off because there's lots of techniques going on here, cooked in such a small space, but it's, it's beautiful. It's a good portion of food. It's got colour to it, it's got flavour. The samphire, it's salty, it's got crunch to it, which I like. Saffron potatoes are well cooked, and the fish is well cooked. It's just flaking away, and the sauce with the muscle juice running through it is delicious. It's a tasty plate of food. Tom's festival hot dog-inspired dish is the last savoury course to be served. Good, man. His final job is to perfectly sear the pork tenderloin without overcooking the centre. Barbecuing tenderloin, you're using a lot of heat. Now, with traditional barbecue, it's, 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 you've got to have fat in there. Yeah. So it's not yes. in the same way. Pork tenderloin is quite high end, so let's see how it comes across. Yeah, bang on. This is the American mustard mayonnaise. It sounds like my kind of food, but I don't want it to be overwhelmed by the mayo. Other than the pickled cabbage, 
Has every scene been on the barbecue? Yeah. Smells great, Tom. Thanks, Chef. Marcus is raving at festivals every weekend. <laughs> You'll find him out front, a few beers, hair loose. A bit more than that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, service. The presentation looks absolutely spot on. And that beer sauce, I can't wait to get the uh, laughing gear around. All right, Tom, you're going to have to go a bit faster. Yes, Jeff. The cabbage looks a little bit raw, but I'm interested to see what that tastes like. Service. Did you enjoy that? Yeah, I'm happy with that. Getting to cut for the diners is amazing, obviously. They know what they're looking for, and yeah, and I was happy with the dish, so hopefully they enjoyed it as well. Pork was cooked really well, uh, really nice and tender. It was a really nice light pickle on that cabbage, mustard mayo, well executed. The pickled cabbage with the beer sauce stand out the most. But otherwise, I think the roast onion and then also the barbecue, pork tenderloin, all I could taste was like smokiness. The idea behind it, the constructed hot dogs, a great concept. I think there's quite a lot of charred elements on it that can maybe just overpower the dish and turn it into a bit of a smoke fest. I like that Tom hasn't overcomplicated his plate of food. Beautifully cooked pork. And in the sharpness of the pickled um, cabbage just cuts through this dish. I love the mustard mayonnaise. It complements the pork beautifully well, but if you don't like the flavours of the barbecue, you're not going to like this dish. The final course is down to Ixose. His banoffee dessert has nine different elements to plate up. I'm really happy with the fudge, <laughs> the fudge set in time. It's just getting everything plated in time now. Race against time. Banoffee pie is probably my favourite dessert ever. I'm really excited for this one. <laughs> It looks posh for, for street food, isn't it? Yeah, I wanted to push the boat out a little. All right, all right, get you all fancy. <laughs> the main worry is just the frying elements. I need to get them done. I'll start frying them soon. With just minutes till service, Exose still has to make his banana fritters, as well as fry off all his beignet, before he can fill them with banoffee cream. The beignets didn't freeze, so they're still really soft. So they're going to be a bit disformed when they come out the fryer. Not sure if they'll still be able to pipe inside them, but see what happens. What's not to like? Banana, toffee, and you've got the walnuts to add that bit of texture. I'm really excited. That caught my eye on, on the menu. So it's looking good, but your guests are waiting now. You need to stuff those beignets. I don't have time. This would have been the filling for the beignet. Got like four desserts on that. I think I might have done a bit too much, but at least they'll be happy. Ice cream and sauce now. I think getting enough banana flavor into ice cream, you know, and getting it out there, not melted, is another key thing there. So we'll see how they, uh, how they pull it off. You need eight hands to get all this done. That's a lot of work. I'm happy. Service. We've got charred bananas, we've got donuts, we've got fritters, we've got fudges, we've got ice cream, we've got sauce, we've got banana puree here. This guy's gone to town, man. This is my life. <laughs> this is my life. Oh. Wow. <laughs> I'm still pleased I chose that dish. <laughs> I'm happy with everything that went out. <laughs> I've really pushed myself and hopefully it pays off. The banoffee pie was delicious. Um, I think the best bit for me was the fudge, which was kind of an unexpected surprise. Different textures, different flavors, not too sweet. Absolutely, absolutely great. The fritters, crispy, light, fluffy. The banana's been caramel as well. The crispy nut in there is beautiful. Even the element of lime in there just freshens it all up. Excellently composed. It's a perfect dessert for me. The banana wasn't too overpowering. It was really delicious, it's spanking again. This one, it's one of the best this I've ever had. It was, it was exactly what I want to order in a dessert. I love this. 
I think this is great. There's bits you can pick up with your fingers, there's bits you can get your spoons stuck into. I think this dish would look great on a fine dining plate in any restaurant and on a pop-up plate like this. It really does work. It's just a fun plate of food. It's delicious, it's creative, and I think Exosé has done really well today. After a gruelling day in the kitchen, the master chef pop-up is over. What a great job our chefs did today. I was very pleased with how they approached this task, and they really did enjoy themselves. They were cooking with a smile on their face, doing something very, very different, and I thought they did us proud. That was brilliant. It was such a cool environment to be cooking in. It's a really nice venue. Such a different challenge. I relished it. Loved it. Amazing. <laughs> Amazing experience. Something I've never done before. So it was, quite, it was quite daunting at first. But yeah, I really enjoyed myself. We asked all our guests to vote for their favourite dish from today. And the chef with the most votes is going straight through to the semi finals. Welcome back, and more importantly, well done. I've heard not only was your food fantastic, it was also creative and different. You did it brilliantly. All of your dishes got votes, but there were two clear favourites. Andrew, with your place dish, and exosé with your banana dessert. One of you is going straight through to our semi-finals. It was very close between the two of you. The chef with the most votes is... exosé. Oh <laughs> wow, what a fabulous dish. It was different, it was exciting, and you certainly pushed yourself. That was incredible. We'll see you in the semi-finals. Thank you. Good luck, guys. Well done, eh? Thank you. Well done. Yes! Ah! <laughs> oh, my gosh. Oh. My heart was beating so fast in there, and now <laughs> it's still beating fast now. <laughs> I feel over the moon. <laughs> There's no words. <laughs> Chefs, don't be disappointed. The odds have slightly changed, but we know how good you are. This is still an amazing opportunity. One plate of food between you guys and the semi-finals. At the end of this, one of you will be leaving us. 90 minutes. Off you go. My dish was a close second. It's definitely a confidence boost. Feels great. <laughs> the sort of public perception of military chefs is we're just mass caterers, you know, cooking huge, big pots of, like, chilli and lasagna and curries and things like that, which we absolutely do do. But there's another side to us. We do cook fine dining food. And I feel like I've sort of proved that by getting to this point of the competition. Andrew, back in our kitchen, cooking for a place in the semi-final. What are you doing? So I'm going to do a Thai dish. It's a tom yam nam sai. Tom yam nam sai is a hot and sour soup that's clear. This comes from my wife. She's from Thailand, so I'm so lucky to get Thai food every day. It's very traditional, but in execution and presentation, it's where I've put a bit, bit of chefiness into it. 
Each individual element you taste is going to taste different. I'm confiting the tomatoes. I'm going to lightly torch the prawns. I'm going to make a consomme for the hot and sour soup. Why would you choose now to, to do a, a, a dish inspired by, by the love of your life? I think I need to, like, prove that I'm not a one-trick pony. I've got a breadth of things that I can do in the kitchen. What, what's your wife's name? Uh, her name's Somyong. Has she given you any advice on this? Yeah, yeah. She's given me lots of advice and I've tried to change things and she got quite angry about it, so I need to just stick to what she told me to do, so that's what I'm going to do. Andrew is making a tom yum nom sai, a Thai broth with all the flavours you'd expect. But Andrew is bringing a twist to it. He's making his broth into a consomme. He's going to clarify it so it's crystal clear. The prawns are beautiful. He's got to get the torching of them just right can't afford for them to overcook. Really do love the sound of his dish, as long as he gets it right. I really like this dish. It sounds a little bit different, but that's pretty much my style. Sometimes I spend weeks or months working on one particular thing. I really want to show it off to the judges and see what they think about it. So uh, today I'm cooking uh, poached langoustine. It's served with a corn blini. We have uh, barigoul artichokes and we have uh, saffron and apple beurre blanc. What is worrying you about this? The blinis. Uh, I tried it a few times and it didn't work for half the time. So there you go. <laughs> they didn't work for half the time you practice it. You're yes. still making it today. Yes. I, I love the stress. I love the challenge. So that's just perfect for me. I want the longer scenes to have a little bit of texture to them, but you do want them to be beautiful and soft. You do not want them to overcook because they won't be very nice. Jan is using maize flour made from corn for his blini mix. It's really interesting, but Jan is very concerned about his blinis because he says uh, he's tested a few times and it hasn't always worked. That's a huge risk bringing something into this kitchen, cooking for a semi-final, knowing has a huge chance of failing. Chefs, you are halfway. You have 45 minutes left, please. There is a city in Southern Kerala, it's called Elipe, and the raw mangoes are there in abundance, so that's the main inspiration. I really want to push myself from this point of onwards. I need to put my heart and soul on this dish. Abinda, good to see you back in the kitchen. What are you cooking? So I'm doing a mint and coriander crusted cod with semolina langoustine. I'm making a raw mango curry, crispy samphire, and uh, baby vegetables with a bit of adults powder in it. Semolina langoustine, what is that? I'm going to make a spice mixed, which is called a sambar powder, which is used a lot in southern India and then I'm gonna coat it with a semolina. Deep fried it, it's gonna come crisp. Wow, is all I can say, wow. A Binder's dish sounds sensational. The crust needs to enhance the flavor of the cod. It needs to really be very careful that it gets it cooked just right. I'm intrigued with these semolina coated longestines. Really hoping that it's a crispy coating with the beautiful softness of the longestine in the center and the hint of all those beautiful spices and chilies running through it. Sounds delicious. Abinda's got some samphire, which he's going to dip into a spice mix and then deep fry him to make him crispy. I've never had samphire this way and I can't wait to try it. Sounds like Abinda's got a lot going on. I hope he manages to complete it because there's some really interesting points here. Chefs, 20 minutes left, please. This dish has to be the best dish I've cooked so far if I want to keep progressing the competition. This is quite a bright, summery dish. And I just like to showcase what you can do with cheap ingredients and try and make them a bit luxurious. I'm doing a pan-fried hake with my sort of take on a saucier. 
Saucierge, olive oil and some capers, yeah. right? But in mine, I'm putting um, gherkins, diced peppers, chervil and some uh, parsley in there. Where are the prawns going? Um, we're going to just finish them in the sauce vierge. Sauce vierge a la prawn. Yeah. It's a very brave man, takes a classic and, yeah. and adds to it. Yeah, very brave. Pan, roasted hake, roasted courgettes, sliced courgettes in a lemon courgette puree. We've also got black olive puree and a take on a sauce vierge with the addition of prawns. It's an interesting dish. We want the hake to be cooked beautifully. Hake is a very fragile fish, and if it's overcooked, we'll start to fall apart. Semi-final place up for grabs. You have four minutes left. All good, all good. Where's your fish? It's an oven. Is it cooked? Almost there. Almost? No. We've got three minutes. <laughs> Last touches, please. Stop. Time's up. Stop. You OK? <sighs> that was the messiest I've ever worked. <laughs> Right, mate. Oh. Yeah, good man. Andrew has made tom yam nam sai, torched prawns served with confit tomatoes, pickled onion, and poached mushrooms, a hot and sour prawn consomme, Thai basil oil, prawn oil, and a seaweed rice cracker topped with prawn and crispy rice noodles. Very, very pretty dish. I think the prawns are sensational. I like the idea of the little crackers on the side. The consomme broth, it tastes great. You know, it's got the clarity to it. I like it, you've refined it. You've raised the bar of your own standard. And I think that's a very clever thing to do. Very brave thing to do. Thai flavours, sweet, sour, salty and hot. No heat in the broth. Where is it? It's in your noodles. That is really clever. That's really, really clever. Well done, Andrew. I think it's very difficult to deconstruct something that is known so well, and then at the end of eating it, what's left on your palate are the flavours that you would get from that dish. I think it's very well done, very well put together. Good on you. I don't mate. I don't. <laughs> I'm very overwhelmed. <sighs> Can't even describe how much I love my wife right now. <laughs> She's changed my life so much. And that's kind of what I put on that plate. Oh. Yan has made poached langoustine with marjoram artichokes, poached apple, a corn and saffron puree, and corn bellinis, garnished with wood sorrel, apple blossom, and deep fried corn silk, and an apple and langoustine beurre blanc. Yum, the langoustines are beautiful and sweet. The artichokes got a bit of sharpness from the apple vinegar running through it. The puree with this corn and saffron is amazing. I think it's fantastic. But this blini, it almost feels like it's got this texture of an eggy bread, which is really odd. You've got beautiful langoustine cookery. You've got beautiful artichoke cookery. I know apple works with langoustine. It works with scallops but apple does not work on this dish because you've got too many other sweet things. I love the artichoke. I love the longestine. I absolutely love that corn puree flavoured with all that heady saffron, but I don't agree with that apple with it.
the reality of this is that I didn't practice the dish. Okay, man. I have to find time. I have to practice. Because the further we go in the competition, the, the less I will have a second chance. It's what it is, mate. Our binder is serving mint and coriander crusted cod with a spiced semolina coated langoustine and smoked yogurt. Crispy samphire, baby carrots, radish and turnips, and a raw green mango curry sauce. It's definitely lacking in a bit of smartness. At this level, going into a semi-final, I think it's not quite smart enough. I really like the cooking of the cod. It's so beautiful and it's just falling apart. The crumb on the top with the hint of mint and coriander is lovely. The garnish worked well, the vegetables being cooked nicely. The langoustine, uh, it's being cooked with the semolina through it. It's got a bit of spice running through it as well. It's, it's nice. But the star on the plate for me is this beautiful curry sauce here. Your raw mango curry sauce is a delight. It's creamy in texture and it's a really nice enveloping spice, especially to coat that fish in. That I really like. You were obviously rushed to rice at the end. It's a tasty plate of food, but what this dish lacks is refinement. I think I have given myself too much to do. I was a bit rushed the last three, four minutes. Fingers are crossed. Finally, it's Tom. He has cooked pan-roasted hake with courgette three ways. Roasted, pureed, and lemon marinated. Mint and lemon Jersey Royals, black olive puree, finished with a prawn sauce vierge. Did you dress this dish blindfolded? No, chef. Well, I don't understand, Tom. It looks like a dog's dinner. Sorry, I'm being harsh, but we're talking about a place in the semi-finals here. Your hake's cooked nicely. It's coming away in really lovely soft flakes. But all courgettes, no matter what shape and size, have the same flavour. So yellow, standard, or courgette with the flour, it's the same texture and flavour. I like the flavours of the olive and the courgette, the sauce verge with tomato and capers. It's lovely. But what I'm struggling with here is it's a dish where I've had everything on this plate before, so I wanted something special. There are little bits of nice cookery dotted through there. You've got the olive puree, it's really nice. The courgette puree is very nice too. The tomatoes bring freshness to the dish. All you've done here is a bit more and a bit more, and before you know it, you've created this big plate of confusion. So yeah, I feel pretty awful, to be honest. Nowhere near the best dish I've done. Thought too far, made it too complicated. Wow, wow, look, you had one absolutely standout chef, and that was Andrew. Took a classic Thai dish and really modernised it and brought it up to a level I didn't think he could do. Fantastic. Andrew did a great job today, spot on. So the three of us are agreed. Andrew goes straight through to the semi-final with Exose. Absolutely. Right, now... We have two more semi-final places and three chefs to discuss. Jan made the langoustine dish. He had the beautifully cooked artichokes on there. The sweet corn and saffron puree, great. Cooking of the langoustine, very nice. I don't think Jan needed to bring apple into this dish at all, but an interesting idea today. What I love about Jan is he honestly does combine new with traditional. Mm. He's got great technique and he's got some very original ideas. 
When Abinder brings spices to his cooking, I, I really enjoy it. And today was one of those days. His green mango curry sauce, I thought, was very, very good indeed. Presentation wasn't great for Mabinda. Fish cookery was a little bit rushed, but you can't deny, though, that Abinda's cookery does taste good. Tom's crammed so much on a plate. We had two purees. Sauce Vierge that he'd added other things to, including prawns, chunks of potato and chunks of courgettes. Before, they were great flavours. But the design of the dish... You know, we've seen much cleaner plates, food really well presented, delivering fantastic flavours. This plate from Tom today was a mess. It's a big, big decision we have to make here. This is for a place in the semi-finals. One chef here right now, we end their MasterChef journey. I'm here to be successful. I'm not here to just be on the edge of being out like this. Annoyed, upset. I don't think they understood completely what I was trying to do, but yeah, I would just be shocked if I went through it now. I uh, really want to go through, you know, I've come so far. I really want to go a bit more uh, further in the competition. So let's see how it works out. You've done incredibly well to get to this stage in the competition and cook some fantastic dishes. Three of you are going through to the semi-final. One of you, unfortunately, is leaving us. The chef leaving us. is Tom. Thank you very much. Good competition. Yeah, massively disappointed, but I'm just proud to have got as far as I have. Pressure in this competition. Never experienced anything quite like it, but it's a great opportunity. It really was. I'll never forget it. It was amazing. Semi-finalists. I've done a lot of things in my career, but this is the most important one for me. This is me showing my life, you know, my wife, my family. I really put my heart into that dish. The fact it went so well is an amazing feeling. You can't explain what's going through in your mind and uh, in your heart and your body. It's unbelievable, but I find it really hard to enjoy because I really wanted to shine but I'm very, very happy to be still standing here. Next time, the second group of chefs face their pop-up challenge. It always is more pressure than I think. Your guest is starting to arrive. On time? We'll see. Before returning to the Master Chef kitchen to fight for their place in the semi-finals. That is a quality plate of food that I've enjoyed every single lick, nibble and sniff of.